Hello, and welcome to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes. On today's episode, it's Razor's Edge by Martha Wells, part of the Empire and Rebellion duology. The book is a character study, one of three planned novels that would each focus on one of the three main characters from the original trilogy and be set during that era. Razor's Edge focuses on Princess Leia Organa and takes place in the weeks prior to the construction of Echo Base on Hoth. The story highlights Leia's leadership skills, her quick wit, and her reservations about being held up as a symbol for the Rebellion and for surviving Alderanians. But before I talk about the book, let's go over some show news. If you look at the show's Twitter page, you can see that the upcoming schedule is through October 8th. However, I may have to change the date for the episode on Battle Surgeons. My job may be sending me to Alaska for 10 days in late August. If that happens, I won't be releasing an episode on August 27th. Most likely, I'll have to delay that episode a week to September 3rd. Now, nothing's set in stone yet, but I wanted to give you all a heads up in case that happens. Of course, I'll keep everyone updated. I didn't get any questions this week, but if you have one, and if you'd like to contact me, please... Feel free to email the show at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send me a tweet at legendslounge1. Ask a question or leave a comment. I'm always excited to interact with people. Now, it's time for today's book, Razor's Edge by Martha Wells. Let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. The story begins in the weeks preceding the events of The Empire Strikes Back. Since the destruction of the Death Star, the Rebels have been on the run, harassed and pursued by the Empire throughout the galaxy. They've begun to set up a new secret base on the ice planet of Hoth, but with the Empire squeezing the world sympathetic to the Rebels, there's a shortage of supplies. Rebel Command receives word of a merchant consortium willing to sell, They send Princess Leia Organa and General Vanden Willard to meet with the consortium and negotiate a deal. When their ship, the Gamble, makes an unscheduled hyperspace stop to call their contact at Arnott Station, they're ambushed by the Empire. Now they're able to escape, but not without taking significant damage to the primary bridge. Leia suffers a concussion, but General Willard is seriously wounded. Still, They make the jump to Arnott Station to meet with the Merchant Consortium and Han Solo's contact, Davit. They arrive in system and find their path to the station blocked by a pirate ship attacking a merchant freighter. Han and the crew urge Leia to go around the attack, but there's something wrong. Leia recognizes the pirate ship as Alderanian in design, a gunship named Aegis. She hails the pirates, but is shocked when they recognize her voice. The captain identifies herself as Alderanian. So is her crew. She asks Leia if Leia will meet with her on the Aegis to talk about what happened after the destruction of their home world. Leia is initially hesitant, but finally she agrees. Leia will transfer to the Aegis with Han and two agents, Sion and Kefar, while the Gamble continues to Arnott Station to meet with their contact and to get General Willard medical attention. Once on board the Aegis, Leia meets with Captain Colleen Matera. Matera tells Leia that the Aegis was on patrol at the outer edges of the Alderaan system when the Death Star appeared and destroyed the planet. Distraught and with nowhere to go, they turned to piracy and soon became indebted to a pirate clearinghouse led by a Lordian named Veist. Leia is stunned. She can't believe that any Alderanian would turn to piracy. But Matera says the crew of the Aegis needed to find a way to retaliate against the Empire. But they didn't want to join the Rebellion. If it wasn't for the Rebels, she says, Alderaan may have avoided the Empire's wrath. Instead, the Aegis started attacking merchants and traders that thrived under the Empire. But it turns out, with Weist, 
the Alderanians bit off more than they could chew. Now, instead of simply stealing cargo and letting the merchant crews stranded call for help, the Aegis was now transporting those crews to Vice Base, where they were held until they were periodically sold to slavers on the Outer Rim. It was a bad deal, Matera admits, and it was getting worse. After talking with Matera and her officers, Leia knows she won't be able to convince them to join the Rebellion, but she hopes she can convince them to stop acting as pirates. First, however, she'll have to get them out from under their debt to Vice. So she and Han travel with the Aegis to the clearinghouse to meet with the pirate leader. The Aegis arrives at the clearinghouse, an abandoned asteroid mine that someone fitted with a starship docking ring. Leia and Matera meet with Vice. Leia tells the Lordian pirate that she wants to hire the Aegis and buy out its debt, but Vice knows Leia and Matera are lying. She knows Leia isn't who she claims to be, but doesn't know exactly what Leia is hiding. Vice tells them that people that want out of their obligations can play a game. If they win, Vice will forgive the debt. Leia knows it's a trap, but she and Matera can't think of any other way to release the Aegis from the clearinghouse. Reluctantly, Leia agrees. Now, while Leia is meeting with Vice, Han leads a small group to try and find where the pirates are holding the crew of the merchant ship the Aegis had captured. They use one of the droid maintenance tunnels to sneak along the docking ring. Han finds the prisoners, but is blocked by one of the old mining droids as it rolls down the tunnel. He can't avoid the droid and is whisked away down the tunnel and into a large cavern that runs throughout the center of the asteroid. Sion, Kafar, and the rest of Han's group double back to the Aegis and wait Leia's return. The game that Vice wants Leia and Matera to play is a simple one. They'll be chasing a small remote in an anti-gravitational field against two other teams. Surrounding the field are three sonic crushers, large mining rings that were used to crush and pulverize rocks. The first team that pushes the remote into one of the crushers wins, but Leia knows something fishy is going on. She warns Matera to keep her guard up for whatever tricks Vice might throw at them. Sure enough, once the game begins, a huge mining droid emerges from the ceiling. Now this droid is modified, with arms containing rock drills and saws and programmed to chase the players around the anti-grav field. Quickly, the droid kills one of the other players, running it through with its drill. Leia knows the only hope the rest of the players have is to end the game quickly. She and a Twi'lek race after the remote while Matera and the others try to keep the droid occupied. But the remote stays close to the droid. There's no way to catch it without coming close to it also. However, Leia notices that the droid can't articulate its arms fully. If she can get close enough to it to get inside its sphere of attack, the droid won't be able to hit her. She and the Twi'lek wait for an opening, then spring forward, landing against the large droid's torso. The droid flails wildly, trying to attack the two beings holding on, but it can't reach them with its arms. As it spins, trying to reach Leia and the Twi'lek, the droid backs into one of the sonic crushers. The huge droid squeals and flees the anti-gravity field, plunging down the cavern to the holding area for the mining droids below. Leia and the Twi'lek hang on for their lives until a blaster bolt hits the droid in its neural processor, stopping it. Leia climbs off the droid, looking around for whoever fired the shot. It's Han. He tells Leia about finding the crew of the merchant ship in the slave-holding pens and being carried here to the mining droid holding area. Leia tells Han to sneak back to the Aegis and warn the crew about Vyst. She and the Twi'lek have to return to the game arena and try to get Manera and the others out. Now elsewhere, Luke Skywalker and Chewbacca are with the main rebel fleet, awaiting word about Leia's expedition. They're working on the Millennium Falcon when General Crix Maydeen walks aboard. Maydeen tells them that the Alliance has lost contact with the Gamble. All they know is that the ship was attacked on its way to Arnott Station. Maydeen suspects a leak in the Alliance communications network, but since only Leia and General Willard knew where they were going to send the message to Arnott Station, Maydeen believes the leak came from someone on the gamble. He asks Luke and Chewie to fly to Arnott Station and to find out what happened. When they arrive, Luke meets with General Willard and learns about Leia leaving the gamble 
and going with a group of Alderanian pirates. Willard tells him Leia took Han and two other officers. Quickly, Luke and Chewie hop back in the Falcon and set off toward the clearinghouse. On the way back to Vice's office, Leia and the Twi'lek begin talking. Her name is Anna Carrot. She's the captain of a small smuggling ship that's been docked at the asteroid for a while. She and her crew have been trying to leave, but Vice hasn't let them. She agreed to play the game to try and leave the system. Leia says she's also trying to figure out a way to escape Vice. Anna Carrot tells Leia that she's willing to help, except she will not put her ship and her crew in harm's way. Eventually, the two reach Vice's office. When they enter, Matera congratulates Leia for winning the game. Confused, Leia asks what happened. Apparently, as the droids started to flee from the anti-gravity field, Leia had accidentally kicked the remote as she hung onto the droid. The remote flew into one of the sonic crushers, winning the game. But Vice doesn't acknowledge the win, saying the players forfeited when they used the droid to break the field. Still, she can't just execute them after so many of the other pirates were watching the game and saw what happened. Vice sends everyone back to their ships but warns them, do not try to leave the docking ring. She's locked the base down. Any ship trying to leave without her permission will be blown to bits. Leia and Matera return to the Aegis and find everyone eager to leave, by whatever means necessary. But Leia refuses. They still haven't freed the crew of the merchant ship that the Aegis had attacked. But she has a plan. The Aegis still has the recordings from when the Death Star destroyed Alderaan. She tells Matera to splice them up and to make them sound like the Empire has found the pirate clearinghouse and is about to attack. They'll create a diversion while Anna Carrot's ship escapes and transmits the fake message just before it jumps out of the system. They decide to split into two teams of five each. Leia, Matera, and their team will create the diversion, setting a seismic charge beneath Vice's office. Meanwhile, Han, Sion, Kafar, and their team will free the prisoners and sneak them through the droid maintenance tunnels and back to the Aegis. Meanwhile, an Imperial Corvette arrives at Arnott Station, looking for Leia's ship. The commander's name is Dagoran. He's also looking for their Imperial contact. Dagoran doesn't know if there were any important rebels on the ship, but he's suspicious. He wants to know why the rebels are at Arnott Station, in an area of the mid-rim that's firmly in the hands of the Empire. When the Corvette docks at the station, Dagoran orders his troops to disguise themselves as dock workers. They investigate the station and eventually find the gamble. Then they easily take the damaged ship, killing two rebel guards and arresting General Willard and the rest of the crew. Back at the pirate base, the plan goes sideways quickly. Han and Kafar are captured trying to free the prisoners. Sion radios Leia to tell her what happened, but there's not much she can do. She decides to take Matera and one of her lieutenants to free Han and Kafar, while the other two prepare the seismic charge. When Han awakes, he finds himself in Vice's office. Both he and Kafar are tied to a couple of chairs. Kafar looks like he's been roughed up a bit, and when Vice starts asking Han questions about the rebels and Leia, Han knows that Kafar has spilled all their information. Vice threatens Han with a portable sonic crusher, a handheld version of the large crushers she used during the game with Leia. It's not as powerful, but up close it will still destroy a person's inner organs, killing them. As Vice brings the crusher closer, Leia springs into the office. A firefight ensues between Leia, Matera, and her lieutenant, and Vice and her two goons. The pirates start to gain the upper hand, pinning Leia and her small squad between some furniture and the wall of the office. But just then, there's an explosion from below. The entire office lifts a few meters and then settles, knocking everyone to the floor. Vice begins to stand, but Leia and Matera both fire, hitting the pirate leader in the chest. She falls, but not before firing a sonic blast from her portable crusher. It hits Matera in the chest. For a moment, Matera looks confused. She looks down, then back up at Leia. Then her eyes glaze over, and Matera falls to the floor. Leia and the lieutenant rush to Matera's side, but there's nothing they can do. 
In a matter of seconds, Matera starts wheezing, then coughing up blood. Then she goes still. Quickly, Leia turns and shoots the remaining two pirates as they try to free themselves from some rubble and try to stand. She and Lieutenant free Han and Kafar and flee from Vice office. As they try to make it back to the Aegis, Leia hears a beep on her comm. It's Luke. He and Chewie just arrived in the system and heard the Imperial attack message. Han tells them it's a ploy to scatter the pirates from around the docking ring. But now that the Falcon's here, he wants Luke to blast an area of the asteroid near Vice office. Maybe it'll convince some of the other pirates that the Imperial threat is real, and it'll give them a distraction while they free the captured merchant crew and escape on the Aegis. Luke and Chewie fire where they're told, and for once, one of Han's plans works. When the two ships arrive at Arnott Station, they drop off the crew of the merchant ship and find the gamble. But the crew's gone. Han discovers they were arrested and taken aboard an Imperial Corvette, but no one on Arnott Station knows where they went. Leia broadcasts a plea for the gamble's crew, and eventually... That broadcast is answered by Commander Dagoran. They set up an exchange. The crew for Leia. But the crew of the Aegis refuses to let Leia hand herself over the Empire. To them, she's all that remains of Alderaan. So, they come up with a plan. At the meeting place, Luke and Kafar will take the Falcon down to the planet and broadcast a beacon. Meanwhile, the Aegis will hide behind the planet's moon And when the Imperials send a shuttle down to the surface, they'll put their pirate skills to good work. At the meeting place, Luke and Kafar land on the surface and set the beacon. Luke is just finishing burying the beacon in the sand when Kafar whips out his blaster and stuns him. Kafar is the leak, an Imperial spy who was hiding on the gamble. When the shuttle arrives, Kafar tells Commander Dagoran about Leia and the plan to attack the Corvette and rescue the prisoners. But his warning is too late. The Aegis attacked the Corvette as soon as the shuttle entered the planet's atmosphere. The crew of the Aegis shows off the skills they've learned as pirates, attacking the Corvette. But they still need to save Luke and the Gamble prisoners. Commander Dagoran offers them a trade, Luke for Leia. She agrees, but she's got a plan. When the shuttle docks with the Imperial Corvette, Leia, Han, Chewie, and Sion stow in one of the Aegis's escape pods and launch themselves toward the Corvette. They latch onto the Corvette's escape pod retrieval dock, blow open a hole in the side, and head to the shuttle docking bay. There, they blast a few stormtroopers and free Luke. Quickly, Leia sends a message to the Aegis. The Alderanian pirates attack. They attach themselves to the side of the Corvette and storm the ship. Quickly, they mop up the remaining Imperials and free the Gamble prisoners. The Rebels take control of the Imperial Corvette. They rename it the Gamble II. As they're about to depart, Leia calms the Aegis and tells the crew they can still join the Rebellion. She gives them the name of a Rebel drop point and tells them if they want to join, they can rendezvous in one month. Time for a break. When we return, I'll talk about what I really liked about this book and some of the stuff that didn't really work for me. I'm Aaron Motes. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Thanks for listening to this episode of the show, everybody. Here on the Star Wars Legends Lounge, we like to celebrate the stories from the Star Wars Legends line of books but allow me to take a moment and recommend a book from Star Wars canon. Rebel Rising tells the story of a young Jyn Erso before the events of Rogue One. Orphaned at five years old, Jyn is taken in by the radical Saul Guerrera, a man willing to go to any extremes to fight the Empire. But how far will Jyn go for the cause? It's a story of tragedy, betrayal, and learning how to believe in oneself. The perfect read for fans of Rogue One. That's Rebel Rising by Beth Revis. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. 
the show that talks about the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes, and today I'm talking about Razor's Edge by Martha Wells, a Princess Leia story set a short time before The Empire Strikes Back. First off, a little bit of background information. Razor's Edge is the first of a planned three-book series focusing on the big three from the original trilogy set during that time period. They were going to be character studies of Leia, Han, and Luke. Razor's Edge was the first one. It was released in September of 2013. The Han book, Honor Among Thieves, was released in March of 2014. And then it was supposed to be the Luke Skywalker book, Heir to the Jedi. However, in April of 2014, Lucasfilm announced that all of the books and comics released prior to April 25th, 2014, in the old expanded universe, were now going to be designated as Legends stories and no longer canon. Well, after that announcement in April of 2014, Razor's Edge and Honor Among Thieves were no longer considered canon. However, Heir to the Jedi had not yet been released. It would end up being released in 2015. And it was one of the first canon books to be released. One of the first new Disney canon books. It was the Luke Skywalker character study. These were supposed to be under a series designation, Empire and Rebellion. It was the Empire and Rebellion trilogy. Now it's the Empire and Rebellion duology, focusing just on the two books about Leia and then Han. With Razor's Edge, I have now read all three. I had previously read Honor Among Thieves, and I had previously read Heir to the Jedi. I can tell you right now that Heir to the Jedi is not one of my favorite canon novels that I have read. And I've spoken to enough people who have read that book that really only read canon novels that they're kind of in agreement. Heir to the Jedi is not a very good book. That's just our opinion. You may think something else. You may really like the book. And if you do, I'm really happy for you. However, Razor's Edge and Honor Among Thieves are the legend stories now from this series. I think Honor Among Thieves is the better of the two books. And I say that not being the biggest Han Solo guy. I prefer the character of Leia more than Han. I always have. But the story of Honor Among Thieves is pretty fun. It's kind of like Ocean's Eleven in Star Wars. Razor's Edge, I would consider an okay book. It's not great. It's not bad. I'm not a big fan of the plot, uh, especially toward the end after they've escaped the pirate clearinghouse and then they have to come up with another plan to rescue the gamble prisoners from the Imperial Corvette. It just seems like there was an extra ending almost when there was a natural conclusion escaping the pirate clearinghouse. Anyway, I think the plot leaves something to be desired. And it's one of those books in Legends where the big three do everything. And those of you who have read enough Legends books, you know what I'm talking about. You have Leia, you have Han, you have Luke, and it's almost like nobody else in the Rebellion can do anything. These three save the day for everyone. Believe me, my favorite thing is the original trilogy. And let's face it, in the original trilogy, it's Luke, Han, and Leia. They do it all. But when it comes to expanding the universe, whether it be in Legends or Canon, you know, it's almost like, would Leia, a leader of the Rebellion, really be one of the four people that gets in this escape pod and tries to sneak aboard the Imperial Corvette in order to save Luke. When the Aegis has an entire crew of 
Alderanians who are trying to make up for the fact that they have been pirates. You know, that's just one of those little things that bugs me a little bit. But nobody wants to hear about what I don't like about the book. We want to hear about the positive things. So, I think the book does a good job as a character study showing Leia's best traits. Her strength, her leadership abilities, her quick-wittedness, and her compassion. Those of us that love Princess Leia, how did we fall in love with her? We did when she grabbed the blaster out of Luke's hands in the Death Star, blasted a hole in that grate, and rescued the two bumbling heroes that had come to rescue her. That's when we fell in love with Princess Leia. She was the take charge kind of person that everyone looked up to. Was she brash? Yes. But did everyone know that she had their best interests at heart? Absolutely. And you see that in this book. There are some inner thoughts that Leia has where she basically tells herself that she must remain strong for the people of the gamble after it's attacked at the beginning of the book by the Imperials because the captain of the ship and the first mate were now dead on the bridge. And it was up to her now that General Willard had suffered those serious injuries. It was up to her who wasn't even a member of the crew to get everyone to safety. And she just naturally took charge and she was able to reform the remaining officers in the secondary bridge and get the gamble out of harm's way. Again, as she's talking to the pirate leader, Weist, you see her diplomatic skills on display as she's trying to bargain for the Aegis and trying to bargain for the old Iranian pirates trying to get them out from under the debt that they owe Weist. She knows that Weist can tell that something fishy is going on. She knows that Weist can tell that Leia and Matera are lying on some level. But still, through most of the conversations, Leia remains a step ahead of the pirate leader. And she's able to work on the fly. When Han and Kafar are captured, as soon as they start their plan to rescue the merchant vessel crew, Leia ad-libs. She breaks her own squad in half. And she and Matera, and Matera's lieutenant, go to rescue Han. So, you know, she's a person of action but she's a person of deep thought and she's a person of deep introspection. One of the parts of the book that does a good job of humanizing Leia is when she's talking to the Aegis's crew after they first meet and they're basically holding her up as the last vestige of Alderaan and whatever she says is basically gospel. But in her mind, she sits there and she resents being held up as a symbol for the rebellion, for everything they lost at Alderaan. She knows people are going to look at her with pity and with sympathy over the loss of her homeworld, and she's come to terms with that. But she resents being put up on this pedestal as this perfect specimen of what Alderaan was and this symbol of everything that the Rebellion stands for. Because Leia thinks the Rebellion stands for more than just Alderaan, and more than just the ideals of this teenage girl who only a few years before was a junior member of the Senate. So a lot of Leia's inner thoughts in this book are really interesting, and... Honestly, I think those are the best parts of the book. 
The plot line, not so great, but Leia's thoughts, Leia's feelings, Leia's inner struggles are really interesting. And for that, I would say read this book, particularly if you are a fan of Leia. If you're not a big fan of Leia, eh, this is one you could skip. But if you are a fan of Leia, and you don't mind that the plot is a little convoluted, then I would say you'd probably enjoy this book. Now, could we see anything from this book in the future? Could anything in this book be made canon? The story can't. I don't see any way that the story could be adapted for canon, unless it would be in something like a comic book. And I'm pretty sure that if it was, it would just be the parts with the pirates. I don't think they would add on the part at the end with Luke being taken hostage by the Imperials. I think if they were to do any type of adaptation, I do think it would be interesting to see more in canon about others who survived Alderaan. I know there are a few people here and there in canon books, some that I've read, some that I haven't read, but I do think it would be interesting to see a little bit larger group like the crew of the Aegis that all survived together and what they decided to do in order to adapt to the new galaxy. Of course, any of these characters could be used in the future in canon, mostly just their names, maybe some of their characteristics, but the story I don't think would fit very well. But that's just my opinion. It's time to wrap up on our next episode, another one of the legend stories that I've never read. Yoda, Dark Rendezvous by Sean Stewart. So please join me for that on July 16th. Until then, if you'd like to get in contact with me, please email the show at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send me a tweet at legendslounge1. Ask me a question or send a message. I'd love to hear from each and every one of you. Thank you so much for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge this week. I'm Aaron Motes. Remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.